Hi, this is a, one of the selected topics videos in the series from the Functional Movement and Fitness Corporation or Seas Health. It's not one of the um, uh, main video educational series. This is dealing with very uh, specific topics intended for educational purposes for healthcare providers. And today we would like to talk about um, the um, be going beyond serratus anterior in secondary entrapment at the shoulder. So, for instance, rotator cuff. In rotator cuff problems, a lot of people are recognizing the importance now of serratus anterior, but there are other muscles that contribute to the problem, and it's a much more complicated issue. Uh, my name is Mark Brzezinski. Um, these lectures are intended for educational purposes and not to manage individual patients. They are not a substitute for seeing healthcare professionals. Among the reasons are patients vary and no brief presentation substitutes for formal training. Again, my name is Mark Brzezinski and my background has been discussed in previous videos and is on the web page or you can freeze to read it if you want. Uh, these are, in all our slides, we're starting to put these in um, general considerations and musculoskeletal disease because they seem to come up a lot no matter which topic you're discussing. Like the first thing is, do we need to do anything or do we need to do certain things? So in the case of the patient who clinically has... Um, no, uh, exam, their exam is inconsistent with spinal stenosis. Getting an MRI to look for spinal stenosis or getting back -ec imaging as a whole, which we talk about in another lecture, is questionable. Or in a setting of where you think somebody has a meniscal tear, well, is it going to change your management doing imaging? But in the case today, we're talking about dysfunctional shoulder blades and how they can cause problems, particularly the glenohumeral joint. And so the answer is yes, we would be doing something about it. And the other question that comes up very often is we're in, we're in a very changing time in this field. I mean, I've been in it uh, since at least the mid nineties, but um, we're seeing uh, people learning terms or brief concepts and they're stating them but not really doing anything or explaining it. So an example is you'll see people mention scapular dysfunction or the kinetic chain or neuromuscular dynamics but then they don't really link it to anything and so an example is I saw a video of somebody giving an exam and they did seven different maneuvers I would estimate to look at scapular dysfunction but it had no idea of what to do with the scapular dysfunction or what the differences in the actual physical exam meant. So we've talked about this concept before failed rotation can lead to entrapment of the rotator cuff. Upper right patient presents with pain consistent, let's say, with a supraspinatus tendon um, injury. And then uh, on exam, we pick up the serratus anterior in the lower left image. The short blue arrow is non-functional, and we'll talk about why it can become non-functional. And then uh, when, when you lift your arm above your head, which is a functional movement. Again, we're about functional movements, not functional um, movement uh, systems or um, tests. So there's other people who do excellent work in that area. Um, this is about watching functional movements, walking, somebody lifting their arm above their head. Uh, in this case, when you lift your arm above your head, one third of that motion is scapular rotation. And if the scapula doesn't rotate, 
bad things can happen, like entrapment of the rotator cuff. Um, I was looking for the words functional move screening. Um, and for people interested in that, I would recommend you go to their web pages or videos. So there's, you know, the top, the area really of scapular dysfunction, to my knowledge, began in the late 90s and Ben Kibler was one of the big people in this area. And uh, I believe there's only been two scapular summits, one in 2009 and one in 2013. And just summarizing, and I recommend, I've got the reference on here and uh, part of the abstract, but basically scapular dysfunction is a serious issue. Um, it needs to be treated. It causes problems in the rotator cuff area. Um, and we don't know a lot about the specifics. I mean, there's a link to serratus anterior, but there are other issues clearly involved. So first, why does serratus anterior not work? And this is based on the patient population we see. So one reason, and these can be interrelated, one reason is fatigue. I mean, you can simply, um, uh, you can simply uh, fatigue your muscles. So I regularly, for example, um, I, I've been in martial arts all my life, Krav Maga, since around 2000, and uh, you can get fatigue of serratus anterior and the rhomboids uh, during a workout, and then the next day when you're lifting things, you can notice that you'll have a little bit of discomfort up in the glenohumeral region, and so you can fatigue out, and this holds in other systems too. In parapatella or patellofemoral syndrome, you can see people people fatigue out. Somebody who's been on a a long run, and the next day they're lifting something, and their kneecap pops. That's a little bit different than chronic problems. Now, some people have issues with other muscles too. It may be in synergy with serratus anterior dysfunction, or it may be the cause of serratus anterior dysfunction. We're going to focus on pec minor. One of the reasons it, it that and pec minor could be tight from weightlifting, or it could be tight as a compensatory mechanism. Another reason is deconditioning. A lot of people are built much better on the anterior surface of their body than the posterior surface. And then there's long thoracic nerve injury, which you see pretty commonly. Um, the uh, This is a very long nerve. It comes from the cervical region, and it comes down pretty superficially uh, to below the scapula. And... It, you know, hypothetically, the reason I would postulate that is, is evolution. I think that when people are on four, all fours, uh, or ancestors, then uh, the nerve coming from the neck made a little more sense. But right now, it's probably a nerve which we wish came out in the thoracic region and not didn't have such a long course. It's so easy to injure. Now, this sort of illustrates the problem, and uh, to the credit of the people who are uh, involved in the summit or do, are some of the pioneers in this area, they basically are saying, um, you, you know, you just have a dysfunctional or non-dysfunctional scapula, because we really don't know, and I'm going to give you a little bit of insight on that, how we see other things involved. And a lot of it is based on modeling and examining individual muscles. So if we take a look at the woman on her on the left who is 34 years old, uh, she had a previous neck injury and she's got on the right of the image, uh, her scapula is winging, but it's in, it's not anatomically anteriorly, superiorly, or externally rotated. And so she's, you can stick literally four fingers underneath her scapula and it's dysfunctional, but it's not, um, 
uh, it, this isn't uh, as complicated as some of the other patients we see. And actually, you can see in some patients uh, who come who look like their scapula is fine, you have them lift their arm up and down ten times in this quote scapular plane. And the reason why I put it in quotes is a um, large percentage of the patients we see the scapula isn't in that 30 degree off the frontal plane uh, position. It's actually in some other position. And if we look at this middle image, that's a gentleman in his mid 20, uh, he's about 24 years old, who a, does a lot of weightlifting. And you can see this scapula is severely, I mean, you can get your five fingers underneath the scapula, but it's also have strongly displaced it's tilted it, it's anterior and externally rotated and so um and the image to the right uh a tens unit was put on a serratus anterior and you could see you got significant improvement so the muscle still has function and this may be due to damage in the nerve but you know these are areas that just still more research need to be done. But the point is, we're not in the left and middle image, we're not dealing with the same problem. The one on the left, we're primarily dealing with strengthening serratus anterior. The one on the right, we really need to get the shoulder blade back into position again. And this is partially illustrated in this image. So on the left, the black arrow shows the scapula in a relatively normal position. And it, it's close, its medial border is close um, to the spines of the vertebrae. But in, on the right, we have a tight pec minor in addition to um, uh, serratus dysfunction. And so it's pulling, uh, it's pulling the whole scapula up anterior externally. So there's a dysfunction of the entire uh, shoulder girdle and we've made the point in previous lectures you can't talk about a shoulder joint it's a shoulder complex they're all interrelated. Why is pec minor tight? I don't know and it, it could be compensatory in some patients. Um, it's a muscle involved in protracting the shoulder a lot in pure protraction the other function, main function of serratus anterior, and it may need, you know, the maybe somebody who's protracting excessively, or it may be uh, due to uh, muscle building program of the pecs, and they just happen to build um, pec minor in excess to serratus anterior. But we do see this commonly to the muscles that are commonly tightened or pec minor and serratus anterior. And, um, sorry, pec minor and levator scapula. So um, when you, uh, now when you look at pec minor, we just discussed that. When you look at levator, the rhomboids, the traps, and there's different three sections of the traps and they have different functions in moving the ro uh, the scapula. But uh, the levator in particular may be tight because it's the point of rotation. When serratus anterior pulls, it's one of the muscles that's at the pivot point. And so it may be tightening as a compensatory mechanism as the shoulder blade is failing uh, to rotate effectively. But these are all speculation, and studies really need to be done in these areas. But what isn't speculation is they need to be corrected, I, at least in our opinions. I, I think that when you do a shoulder exam and find that it's positive for um, any kind of finding from instability to uh, entrapment in the rotator complex, and the entrapment can be either up against bone or ligament or it can be actually within the glenohumeral joint. If you get those, you don't know if they're going to go completely away if you can get the scapula back into the scapular plane again. But when you have muscles that are in particular very tight, 
and are pulling uh, the scapula out of position, it's really hard to interpret what the results are. So the bottom line of this lecture is that it's le at least our feeling and it's our focus to get the scapula back into the scapular plane again. And so it's just more, it's more than just strengthening serratus anterior in, in a significant percentage of the patients. Again, these lectures are educational and not intended to manage individual patients. They are not a substitute for seeing healthcare professionals. Among the reasons our patients varies and no brief presentation substitutes for formal training. Thank you.